All right, good morning. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the book of Joel and chapter 3. We're going to read verse 9 down to verse 21, and we're going to be thinking this morning about war and peace. So that's kind of the theme. And, of course, there's going to be a war described and then followed by a time of unprecedented peace. And so we'll begin in verse 9, and it begins this way. Joel chapter 3, verse 9, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, Prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation, for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. So as we consider this theme of war and peace, of course, we we did uh, mention verse 9 last time, this proclamation that is to be made among the Gentiles. And of course, it's prepare for war. And uh, just uh, how relevant, uh, we just even in this last week, we've uh, heard about uh, Sweden telling its people to get ready for war, and now Germany telling its people to get ready for war. Kind of interesting how relevant it is, but all the Gentiles are going to be uh, basically giving this message, prepare for war. There's a war coming. Of course, this war is going to be a worldwide war, but it's going to be very much concentrated in one place, and that is going to be in the land of Israel. And again, to wipe out the Jewish people, prepare war, wake up the mighty men. In other words, get all your your soldiers, all your trained men, get them together. It says, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. So the call is, is for them to come up, to come up for war. And then, of course, if you've got the assembling of, of armies being mobilized and put together, you have to have weapons for them. And so uh, that leads us very nicely into verse 10, where it says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. So uh, not only are the warriors <laughs> all required, now because you have such a mass mobilization of armies, there's also a, a, a demand for more weaponry. And so things that normally, production that would normally be geared up for peaceful things like plowshares and uh, are, are there to be beaten into swords, it says, and pruning hooks into spears, things that would normally be uh, agricultural implements must be transformed into armaments. So there's there's a massive mobilization of 
military forces. There's a massive armament program getting all these weapons together. And, and of course, usually, we often say this, but war usually results in famine. And part of the reason is that resources that normally would be devoted to agriculture are now being devoted to destruction. And so that's part of the reason that that, is, that occurs. And so uh, this uh, these things like plowshares, they're needed for things like sowing and, and pruning hooks for, for uh, time of harvest. And, and now everything... Everything is being thrown into this battle. Harvests have to give way to hostility, hostilities. Factories busy turning out the instruments of war. Uh, remember Cain and, of course, his metal workers, that uh, uh, the Canaanite civilization in Genesis 4 uh, kind of began to do, you know, this world where men were trying to find happiness outside of God and, of course, the beginning of metal work. Well, this is going to be, as it were, the last assignment of uh, of these metal workers, and that's going to be devoting their time to provide the weaponry for this battle to destroy the nation of Israel. And then I want you to notice just an interesting thing. It says, let the weak say, I am strong. Now, of course, uh, you may have heard a popular chorus, let the weak say, I am strong. And of course, it's usually addressed to, to believers and all the rest of it. But actually, at least in the context here, it's not believers that are in view at all. What it's saying is that this mobilization, it, it, it's not just the mighty men. Even the wimps are being called up. <laughs> Everybody's being called up to this battle, even the weak. And they have to kind of almost talk themselves into being strong because you're going to the battle. Everybody's going to fight. And so uh, basically there's this massive uh, uh, gathering of forces uh, including even the weak, uh, they're going to be mobilized as well. Now, you probably thought as you read these this verse, particularly about beating your plowshares into swords and uh, your pruning hooks into spears, that you also probably remembered verses that seem to say the very opposite of that. And I want to just look at a couple of them in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4. And of course, the same verse is basically repeated in Micah's prophecy, a lot of parallelism between Micah and Isaiah, although, of course, Micah is much shorter. Uh, but in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, it says, He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And, of course, the prophecy of Micah uh, would also tell us exactly the same thing. Micah chapter 4 and verse 3. We'll just read it again. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God. Uh, sorry, I'm reading verse 2, verse 3. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so it's not a contradiction. Basically, uh, what we have here is the, the war that precedes the peace. That's why we're calling this war and peace. There is going to be this last battle, as it were, this, uh, this what we call Armageddon. But then after that, then all of that um, machinery that was used for war is going to be repurposed and it's going to be used again for agriculture because God is going to bring unprecedented blessing. And we're going to see towards the end of the chapter, uh, there's going to be a, a need of a lot of agricultural equipment because there's going to be harvest that the world has never seen before. It's going to be a tremendous time of great blessing. And so basically, uh, these verses are speaking of millennial peace in Isaiah and Micah that will follow the war that Joel is speaking about here in Joel chapter 3. And so in verse 11, it says, Assemble yourselves, Joel 3 verse 11, and come all ye heathen, gather yourselves together, round about thither, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. So the armies, which have already been mobilized, and now they've been armed, 
in the previous two verses, now they're on the move. And of course, their destination, their goal is going to be this Valley of Jehoshaphat, which we're going to see in verse 12. And so from various countries around the world, these armies are going to converge in one place. And as we said last week, Napoleon, when he stood on Mount Carmel and he looked down this, this incredible valley of, of Megiddo, uh, his comment was, this would be the perfect place for all the armies of the world to come to battle. And of course, he's right. And this is where it's going to be. They're all going to come together to this one place. And of course, uh, we can understand as we look at our world today, so much of the friction in wor the world today, even in our own countries, uh, people protesting, uh, calling for a Palestinian state and all of this stuff, all this upheaval, it's all to do with this nation, Israel. And so this battle is going to be against Israel. It's going to be, in a sense, what Hitler began when he talked about the final solution at the Wannasee conference when they met together and talked about how do we wipe out the Jews? Well, he failed. But there's a, a new attempt to eradicate the Jewish people from off the face of the earth. And people are talking about it right now. They're talking about it in the media as we speak. So this is really up to date. People are crying out for the annihilation of Israel. They recognize that's all the problem is this is the epicenter of all the trouble. And so here it's going to actually come to fruition in the sense that they're going to attempt it. Now, they're not going to succeed, as we know, uh, because God has made some promises that are unconditional to that nation that uh, will man will not be able to frustrate in any way. And so as the prophet Joel talks about this great assembling, this great movement of the military of the world, he begins to cry out again for the second time. Remember we said that he's a praying prophet, that sometimes in the midst of his prophecy, he cries out, and we saw it in chapter 1, verse 19. Let's just go back there and remind ourselves. Uh, he says in, in chapter 1, 19, O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pasture of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. And so when he sees the devastation that was caused by the locusts and by the famine, he cries out to the Lord, and he says, O Lord, to thee will I cry. Well, he's doing exactly the same thing here again. This prophet as he sees these armies mobilizing to wipe out his people, <laughs> he says, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. They're getting their armies together. Lord, send your armies down, please. <laughs> send your armies down. Uh, the host of heaven, uh, send, uh, send uh, mobilize your military, as it were, the host of heaven. Send them down, Lord. And so you see something of his, him being driven to prayer by what he sees. By the way, uh, you know, really we should be driven to prayer by what we're seeing today, shouldn't we? The things that we see around us should drive us to our knees, crying out to the Lord, Lord, do something uh, in our desperation as we see uh, our society unfolding before our very eyes. And so he says in verse 12, he says, let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. So we've seen so far, the alarm has been sounded, uh, as it were, the call to arms, the arms have been produced, the armies have been mobilized, but now we we get the destination of where they're going. Where Where is all this mobilization? Like what's the mobilization paper saying? Where's, where are we headed? And of course, it's to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And we've already mentioned this, that uh, it's very hard to pinpoint a specific geographical location called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And that actually really what it's speaking of is Jehoshaphat, the very name itself means the Lord judges. And so it's basically the idea of this, that, that they're being brought together because God is going to judge the nations. Now, of course, we know he's going to do it uh, Jehoshaphat, we believe it was a valley of Berechiah, which again would be in that plain of Megiddo, where he once won a notable victory. 
uh, in the past, uh, uh, King Jehoshaphat. And so this is basically where the battle is going to take place. The Valley of the Lord Judges. Okay, so that's the thought, Jehoshaphat idea, the Lord who judges. So the atmosphere is tense. War is in the air. The agitated nations are all present, ready for a great engagement. They have gathered as many men as possible and as many weapons as possible. What a tremendous show of power and force this is. They're poised to pit their strength against the Lord and his people. How deluded they are in their imaginations. Aren't we reminded of, uh, of Psalm 2? <laughs> the heathen rage and the people, you know, kind of against God and against his anointed. Well, this is, they're doing it again. They did it at Calvary. They're doing it again now. They're, they're, they're coming together. And so in one sense, in all the annals of military history, there was never such a monumental mismatch as this. All the armies of the earth against God. <laughs> what chance do you think they have? What's the odds against the Lord? <laughs> it's pretty pretty poor, isn't it? In fact, uh, just the, the, again, what we see is the pride and arrogance of man who for centuries has shook his fist at God. Now, they're collectively coming together with the express purpose of wiping out God's people, therefore eradicating his credibility because he's, his name is connected with the people of Israel. And so his very credibility is on the line. And so that's their purpose. We're going to wipe out this nation. And so when we get to the actual battle itself, the brevity of the account is... It almost seems to say it's a summary execution. God is just going to wipe them out. It's just going to be that simple. Notice what it says in verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Put ye in the sickle. That's the command. Come, get down. Uh, addressing the mighty ones in verse 11 that he's been speaking about uh, uh, the, in his prayer. And so the prayer of the prophet for heavenly intervention is now answered. How helpless will the armies of human beings be when they encounter, encounter these armies from heaven? And of course, uh, the armies from heaven are, are not even needed really because it's the Lord who through the very sword of his mouth is going to just destroy all these armies as we saw when we studied the book of revelation together but this the description here this valley is described like a large wine press bulging with grapes ready for pressing and as juice oozes from overripe fruit so these assembled nations are saturated with a history of wickedness and are ripe for judgment and God, you know, the vats are overflowing in a sense of the sins of these nations. And uh, they, they, they're, the Lord is about to come and crush them in an unmitigated defeat. So let's just look at some parallel accounts just to see what's really going on. Look at Revelation. And we've, we're fresh out of this book, so we should know a little bit about these things. But Revelation 14 and Revelation 14, verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time is come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. 
And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to them, to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle onto the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God, and the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came up out of the winepress, even to the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. And remember, we said that's exactly the full length of the nation of Israel. Just going to be a massive bloodbath, and the blood splattering high up to the even to the horse's bridles. Such is going to be the devastation that will take place on that day. And so it leads us to verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near the valley of decision. And so uh, this is this, these multitudes, this multi-ethnic multitude gathered in the valley of decision. Now, again, we said last time it's got nothing to do. I think it was in the Q and a session with making a decision for the Lord. The word decision here does not refer to their decision. It is too late for them to decide anything. The decision is the Lord's decision. He is going to decide to judge the nations because of their treatment of his people Israel. And so it's his decision that's in view here. And he will announce and refer to the final verdict of his righteous judgment. His judgment a righteous judgment is the nations must be judged because of what they have done historically through the centuries. There's no salvation on offer here, no room for human choice. Uh, for uh, It's no longer available. We, we've seen through the book of Revelation, there's been many opportunities, even an angel flying through heaven, lots of opportunities. Opportunity is over. Judgment is now. And so this is... This is the day of decision, but it's the Lord's decision. And so he's coming in judgment. The earth is ripe for judgment. And you must ask yourself, like, Lord, how soon? He's, when you look at our world, you wonder how long, Lord, are you going to tolerate what man is doing on the earth right now? The the, the treatment of God's people, the, the treatment of of the unborn. I mean, the things that are going on in our world, uh, the, the wickedness that is just so evident at every level of society. And you wonder how long, Lord, before you come and do this. Notice verse 15, it says, the sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. Not only sun and moon, but also stars will be dark. It seems the very fabric of the creation is unraveling as the earth is plunged into unprecedented darkness. We've already mentioned these phenomena previously in this uh, book in chapter 2. We saw it in verse 10, 10. The earth shall quake before them. The heaven shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. The stars shall withdraw their shining. We saw it again in chapter 2, verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And so the third time it's been mentioned. And so this judgment arrives, climactic judgment has arrived. And so the world is plunged into thick darkness, almost a reflection of the spiritual darkness of these multitudes that are gathered together in this valley of decision. And so all around there's darkness. And then it, 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 we, we read verse 16, that out of the darkness comes a piercing roar. Notice what it says. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And so amidst, amidst this scene of darkness and confusion, <clears throat> above the, the melee of the distraught armies of men, the roar of the voice of the Lord is heard. Not only will his foes shake, the very heavens and the earth will quake 
at his voice. <laughs> Such is the power in his voice. And of course, uh, his word, right? You know, uh, just one word will slay them, Luther's great hymn says, because the sword coming out of his mouth. And so, uh, and what, what comfort here, by the way, that this roar that comes out of Zion will bring absolute quaking and fear in God's enemies. But we also notice for his own people, it says, the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Because remember we said that all these armies are gathered together for one purpose, and that's to wipe out the remnant of the Jews that are left. And as he comes to judge the nations, he's also come to deliver his people Israel. And we compare it with Zechariah, remember, where he's going to send a spirit of grace and supplication upon them. And they're going to they're going to begin to pray because all hope seems to be lost. They're surrounded by enemies and they're going to cry out. And as we said last time, they're going to be saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, save now. And then the Lord Jesus will come to save them. And they'll look on him whom they've pierced. And so this is the, the scene. It's given from a different perspective, but it's the scene here. The Lord is uh, will be the hope of his people. Uh, he, you know, he, one of the titles of the Lord is that he's the hope of Israel. And he will be he will be their hope and their sure hope in this day of disaster. The strength of the children of Israel. The Lord who is the destroyer of his enemies at the same time as the defender of his people and he will be the hope of his people they're no longer going to trust in deceit of di diplomacy or democracy or even in their own military anymore their only hope for survival will be the lord and he will prove to be the hope of israel so verse 17 it says so shall you know that i am the lord your god dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. So wonderful thoughts here. Uh, this day of darkness and judgment will bring a day of blessing because it tells us that now the glory of the Lord is in Zion. I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion. He's back. <laughs> the, the, the very city where they said, we will not have this man to reign over us. He's back and he's dwelling in Zion. And it says the Lord shall be dwelling in Zion, Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem will be holy because all Israel are going to be saved. And truly, there'll be a regenerate people then. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be God's people in, in, in the true sense of the word. They'll, and then he says, there'll no stranger pass through uh, anymore. And what that would tell us is this. Uh, just look back at Luke's gospel, chapter 21. Uh, Luke, I'll oh, look forward, Luke 21, and verse 24. This is a, this is a wonderful verse. Uh, it's just saying, there shall no stranger pass through her anymore. Because we recognize from elsewhere, all the nations are going to come up to Jerusalem, aren't they? They're all going to come to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. We know that from Zechariah 14. But what is in view here is Luke 24, verse 24. It says, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And then read, notice this phrase, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And so when Joel says here in verse 17, there shall no strangers pass through her anymore, what that means is Jerusalem will no more ever again be trodden on the foot of the Gentiles. Oh, yes, Gentiles will come up to worship. <laughs> They'll come up and grab the skirt of a Jew and say, tell me about your God. They will come up, uh, but they'll never dominate the land as they have throughout the times of the Gentiles. No longer the invasion of foreign armies, the heavy tread of Gentile soldiers' boots will no longer fall on her holy streets. And so what a glorious prospect that is for Israel. One of the things that I really love about both um, Isaiah 
his prophecy and also Ezekiel's prophecy. And then not all, but quite a number of the minor prophets is that although they talk a lot about judgment and they talk a lot about the these these days of darkness and gloom, they always seem to intersperse these lovely little pictures of millennial bliss that the judgment is going to happen but it's not going to be forever and th there's going to be a time of of millennial bliss that is going to come on the earth and again it's very hard for me to understand how anybody can read isaiah how anybody can read ezekiel and how anybody can read the minor prophets and not see a future for the restoration of Israel in a time of millennial peace. I, I just, I, it blows my mind how anybody could read these kind of portions and not see a literal fulfillment. It just, I, I can't understand it at all. So what we notice here, look at verse 18. It says, it shall come to pass in that day. Now, again, we're talking about this. We're still in the day of the Lord, but the day of the Lord is not just a day of judgment on the unrighteous, but it's also a day of deliverance and blessing for the righteous. And so it says, it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. So just think about this this verse and the implications of it. It's quite a marvelous verse, really, uh, as we we contemplate it. Um, so after this this emphatic uh, and universal judgment has been executed on the heathen, the prophet summarizes now the blessings which will flow from the throne of God. I want you to notice that because it's it's important that all of these blessings that will flow in the land are going to come from God's presence among his people and from the throne of God. And so he he begins to describe what the land is going to be like. And it's it's kind of interesting that he begins by talking about the mountains because usually the mountains are the least fruitful area uh, of of agricultural productivity. Uh, one of the difficulties in Norway, why that why there was such mass emigration from Norway to places like um, the, uh, the 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 Midwest and the Dakotas and all the rest of it is because most of Norway is mountainous and it's very hard to grow anything. And so people had to leave to get land because mountains are not normally known for productive areas. But what is he saying? He says, the mountains shall drop with new wine, uh, dripping sweet wine, figuratively describing exceptional fertility in areas least known for productive soil. The sweet wine at one time had been cut off. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, if you remember, awake you drunkards and weep and howl and all you drinkers of wine because of the new wine, but it's cut off from your mouth. But now it says the mountains are going to drip with new wine. So there's going to be, you can you get the picture that there's going to be vineyards all up the mountains of Israel. And these vineyards are going to be producing sweet, sweet wine. And so again, obviously tremendous uh, time of, productivity on the earth and then of course he, he not just this but uh, he goes on and he says that the hills are going to flow with milk and and again the the implication is this um that the the uh the cows the the, the dairy cows and the goats will dispense a flow of uninterrupted milk. And, and again, they will be grazing on the mountains. They'll be actually grazing and, and producing uh, beautiful milk. And so it says, uh, again, in that day, the mountain shall drop with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk. And so that's the, that's the picture. And of course, uh, we already saw in chapter one, in this time of barrenness, it says in verse 18 of chapter 1, How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. But now, in this millennial time of blessing, the hills will be filled. And you just get this picture. Cattle uh, just uh, producing abundant 
supply of milk because they've got so much pasture, even on the hills of Judah. Also, he mentions that um, uh, all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth out, out of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. Now, of course, when we, we think of this, um, uh, it's really talking about the brooks of Judah or the, the, the wadis of Judah. And, and normally what happens in Israel is that um, uh, during the dry season, a lot of these water brooks dry up completely. It's only the, the winter rains that cause these brooks to flow. But that is not going to be a problem anymore. In fact, during the millennial time, the land will indeed just be filled with abundant supply of water. Now, where's it going to come from? Well, he wants us to know where it's going to come from. All the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. So again, so we're seeing the source of this. This is this is from the house of God, actually from the throne of God. Out of the throne of God is going to flow this river. Now, uh, again, we it's almost like conditions of Eden. Remember in Eden that there was uh, the river that flew out of Eden and went into into four different branches. And so we're kind of almost back to kind of Edenic conditions, but it's all going to flow from Jerusalem and from the temple. Now, again, what we find here is that Joel is in perfect harmony with Zechariah and he's in perfect harmony with Ezekiel in telling us that there is going to be a river that is going to flow out of the temple in Jerusalem. And so, and it's going to go into the Valley of Shittim. We'll talk more about what that valley is in a moment, but it's going to issue from the sanctuary, indicating, first of all, the presence of the Lord is the source of all good. And so all the the new conditions, really, uh, uh, what we get this, it's coming from God. God is giving this to the, to the nation. It's coming out of his house, as it were, this, this river, and it's going to go down this Valley of Shittim. Now, um, often this area known as the Valley of Shittim, it was um, uh, on the east of the River Jordan, and there was a lot of acacia trees there uh, because, again, it was, it was generally a very, very dry area, and only the acacia trees could survive in that area. But now it's going to be flowing with abundance. So let's just look at the, the other references. Let's go, first of all, to Zechariah chapter 14, just to see this universal testimony we're getting from the prophets of this amazing uh, flow of water that comes out of the house of God. So Zechariah 14, verse 8. It shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea in summer and in winter shall it be. So here we've got this river coming out of the house of the Lord. It's going to go to both the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. That's the former sea and the hinder sea. So it's going to come out. It's going to divide. One half is going to go to the Dead Sea. One half is going to go to the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. And it'll be, there won't be a dry time in winter and in summer. So it's going to be a perpetual supply all year round. Doesn't no no change, no alteration. Now look back at the prophet Ezekiel 47. And we've talked about this in previous studies, but it's good to again just be reminded. Ezekiel 47, again in these marvelous millennial chapters where he describes the 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 millennial temple and by the way we've said this before but i say it again on unashamedly that the the dimensions of the millennial temple would not fit on temple mount at all it, it's just way too big and so there's going to be massive geographic changes we know that when the lord jesus puts his feet on the mouth of mount of olives right there's going to be a, an earthquake and it's going to split in two so there's going to be tremendous topographical changes. And so, and that's going to be necessary because the, the Ezekiel's temple just won't fit. Uh, no matter how you try and make it, it will not fit. It's too big. 
And so God is going to change the whole topography of the land. But out of Ezekiel's temple, it says, Afterwards he brought me again, verse 1, into the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east. The waters came down from under, from the right side of the house and the south side of the altar. Then he brought me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without into the other gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line, and of course they measured the depth of the water, and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And so I want you to just to, we'll break in now in verse um, verse um, 8. Um, it says, Then said he to me, These waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the desert, and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. Now remember, the Dead Sea <laughs> is dead, right? But now this water coming out of the temple is going to cause the waters to be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of, of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed and everything shall live whither the river cometh, and it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi, even unto Engalim, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets, so there will be commercial fishing that will take place in the Dead Sea. Now, you don't see any of that right now, <laughs> right? It would be impossible. Nothing can live there, right? The salt content is so high, nothing can live in it, but there's going to be commercial fishing, and it says, they spread forth their nets, their fish will be according to their kinds as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. So just like in the Mediterranean Sea, there's going to be lots of fish in them. And it says, the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. So there'll be a reminder, probably the area where Sodom and Gomorrah was, there'll be a reminder there, it'll be salt marshes. But by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade, so on and so forth. And their waters they issue out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaves thereof for medicine. So again, what we're seeing here, unprecedented changes in the land of Israel, topographical changes. Uh, we often talk about uh, some of the Psalms talk about a river that flows out of the city of God. And it's kind of ironic because there is no river in Jerusalem or the city of God, but there will be. And so there'll be massive changes. But these changes are not going to be universal. Notice it says Egypt, verse 19. Usually when we think of Egypt, we think of the Nile River and we think of a place that's very prosperous. But it says Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness. For the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. So two nations are singled out here that are not going to experience these tremendous millennial blessings, Egypt and Edom. And the reason is because of the violence done to the sons of Israel. And so both are mentioned probably because they indicate Israel's oldest enemies. Going back a long time here, this ancient hatred between Edom, the, uh, the descendants of Esau, and Egypt. Uh, so if you think of their history, Pharaoh ordering to kill the baby boys just prior to Israel's expulsion from Egypt, uh, Shishak plundering the temple during the reign of Rehoboam, uh, Pharaoh Necho slaying King Josiah in the plain of Megiddo. I mean, there's just a long history of Egyptian uh, cruelty towards the children of Israel. And so now they're going to suffer. And this that has worshipped the Nile as kind of the place where all of their fertility, all their prosperity comes from, uh, they are going to be uh, desolate. Edom as well. Again, the, the Edomites, um, they 
they participated in the overthrow of Babylon uh, against Israel. Uh, they wanted the land. They plundered part of the land for themselves. They're, they're going to suffer tremendously. And so this, this is going to be their, their lot uh, in this, these last days. It's kind of interesting that so far in this chapter of prophecy, uh, we've, we, we had back in verse 4, you had Tyre and Zidon and the, and the palace, coast of Palestine or the Philistines. So, so you, you had enemies of Israel in the north, with Tyre and Sidon, and then you had uh, directly uh, enemies um, on the on the the east uh, with Edom, and the south with Egypt, and west with Philistia. So it's kind of like all the enemies of Israel are going to be dealt with by God, and Israel themselves are going to flourish and prosper. And so, verse twenty, it says. But in contrast to the desolation of Egypt and Edom, he says, but Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. So there's going to be a land and a city, both personified here, that's going to enjoy perpetual flourishing during this, what we call the millennial reign of Christ, without fear of foreign invasion, without fear of forced exile, a time of unprecedented peace. We said war and peace. War in the early part of the chapter, peace now, tremendous peace. The days of invading armies and bloodshed will be past. No more captivities or exiles will be expected. No temporary suspension of hostilities, no fragile ceasefires, but permanent peace and security will be enjoyed by both the land and by its capital. And of course, the reason is the Lord is going to dwell in Zion. Verse 21, I'll cleanse their blood what that I have not cleansed, for the Lord shall dwell in Zion. And so Messiah will dwell in Zion. He's going to dwell in the midst of them. Uh, the Lord is going to be right there. And so they're going to enjoy this unprecedented blessing with him in their presence and it's going to be a, a wonderful, wonderful time of, of unprecedented blessing. But he says in verse 21, and this is a kind of an interesting little section. He says, I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, but the Lord dwelleth in Zion. So the Lord is going to purify his people from their defilement of the past. And he specifically mentions unavenged blood now what does that refer to we're going to cleanse their blood that i have not cleansed could it be i won't be dogmatic but could it be a possible reference to the innocent blood of the messiah that was shed at calvary do you remember what they said matthew 27 verse 25 let's just read it for a second, very sobering verse, Matthew 27, verse 25. Then answered all the people and said, said this, his blood be on us and on our children. Wow, what a staggering statement. His blood be on us and on our children. The blood guiltiness had been confirmed by others like Stephen, who said, uh, you have been betrayers and murderers of your own Messiah, Acts 7.52. And now the nation are going to be cleansed. He says, I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. What is the blood they're going to, that's going to be cleansed of? I think it's going to be the guilt of the rejection of their own Messiah. You see, remember Zechariah? They'll look on him whom they've pierced, and they're going to mourn for him like one mourns for his only son. They're going to realize we have crucified our Messiah. We shed his blood, and he will cleanse them from that. And as a result of that cleansing and all the blood guiltiness gone, 
he will restore to them like he did david going to be fully cleansed uh, of his uh, sin their sin is going to be fully cleansed and they are going to enjoy the presence of the lord proof that they're forgiven proof that their cleansing has taken place is that the lord will dwell in zion from that day forth ezekiel would tell us the name of the city shall be called Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there, dwelling in the midst of his people. And so, yes, there's going to be war, but it's going to be followed by a time of millennial bliss and tremendous peace. And they're going to be forgiven, even from that horrendous sin of crucifying their own Messiah, and they'll be cleansed from all of it. And, of course, we know, again, we go back to Zechariah in our minds. There is a, 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 a fountain that will be opened for sin and for uncleanness. We often say it, don't we? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stains. And so Israel... What a wonderful ending to the book of Joel. They've gone from barrenness through the valley of brokenness into unprecedented blessing. And what does that blessing look like? Well, yeah, all lots of, you know, prosperity and, and you know, kind of hills flowing with milk and wine, all the rest. Of it. But the most important thing is cleansed and the Lord dwelling in their midst. In a, in a certain sense, we're already tasting something of the powers of the age to come, aren't we? You know how Hebrews talks about tasted of the powers of the world to come? See, already we're cleansed from all of our sin, and the Lord dwells in our midst. So we're, we're in a sense, we're getting a little foretaste of what Israel are going to enjoy in a coming day. Oh, how blessed we are to be fully cleansed of all our sin and have the Lord in our midst. May we be encouraged with these thoughts and that thus endeth the book of Joel.